Well, we have Philip Vincent on the show here tonight. And uh, Philip, I, I really appreciate your time. But, you know, I'm going to put you on the spot pretty, pretty early. Because okay. before we hit record, you even said we're going to talk today about possibly creating an oil well of free leads. And uh, I think that's a, that's a pretty big statement. So uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. But before we kick things off, if you want to make sure that uh, Philip is a good fit for you because he does help other people with uh, some of the strategies he talks about here, head over to momshouse.com. But I really appreciate your time today, Philip. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, I, I hope to provide a ton of value. I think uh, we were talking about the uh, real, you know, re the, for getting into real estate, like if I had to start real estate over today, what would I be looking at doing? And I feel like there's so much trendy stuff going on, like the ringless voicemails and the, we're back to cold calling again. Like when I hear mm -hmm. the cold calling is the hot thing, I'm like, oh, picking up the phone and calling people, that's the hot thing now. And I feel like what I'm going to talk about today is like actually something that's, um, it, it, it's sustainable through any market. It's not trendy or sexy what I do, but it, when I say an oil well, it's, it's, it's building relationships inside of a, the senior living world uh, in a way to build relationships that will bring you appointments to buy houses and we're all trying to be in the house buying business and I feel like sometimes we get stuck being in the marketing business you ever, you ever feel that way Jack yeah yeah no I feel like that's the majority of my job is is marketing agreed agreed and we all say we're house buyers but you know you when somebody asks you, you say oh I, I'm a house guy or a investor but really we're in the marketing business and I I've flipped my business around completely to where the leads come to me or the appointments come to me and I, I don't really hunt anymore sure well, let, let's start at the beginning here. How did you start into real estate investing? Great question. I, when I was 20 years old, I built my first house and I got into development. And so I like to tell everyone I did this business backwards. Uh, a lot of people I talk to that are wholesalers today. They want to start getting into flips, to get into rentals, to get into building houses or developing. And I say, well, I started that way and I worked my way back to being a wholesaler. And, it's, and the reason why is pretty clear. Uh, being a general contractor did not fit my personality. I'm not a good adult babysitter, which is what I call general contracting. And mm -hmm. so finding good contractors, we all know is really hard. Even at a scale, it's really hard business. And um, I really liked the act of getting in front of deals. I'm a deal junkie. Um, my happy place is going on five appointments in a day, uh, meeting with families, trying to figure out their needs and seeing if I can't help them. Sure. And then, uh, so, uh, when you went kind of backwards, like when you were doing the real estate investing, so most of the stuff that you're doing now is that, is it wholesaling, fix and flip? What, what does that look like? Well, today, I've, I guess I've grown even past the wholesaling side. I'm more building this national brand of mom's house to try to find investors like me nationwide. I don't need thousands of investors. I just need um, investors that can uh, work in the senior living space. You know, if you think about investors, who we are as a people, we're a little bit, um, I'm being general, general or stereotypical here. We're kind of uh, big personalities a lot mm -hmm. of times, or, or maybe a little uh, transactional. You know, they're about the money, every, every ad you see. I'll give you an example, Jack. I've been networking in senior living for 10 years. I haven't seen the size of someone's check yet. No one's shown me their check yet when I network in that space. But yet when I'm in real estate... <laughs> every everybody's showing the size of their check they're like check look at this check you know and it's just it's 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 the nature of that business for versus what i'm talking about today which is a warm hug and a kiss and if you don't do it the right way you probably shouldn't even start because if you're not there to help others they're going to see through it anyway and so um, to answer your question you know i did this business backwards i think in 08 09 like everybody i stopped doing the new construction and I started looking at where is the source of these deals coming from. And back then, you know, in 08, uh, we all thought it was from REO properties. And for everyone out there that's bank owned or foreclosure properties. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the market today, I think a lot of people are betting on that all that's coming back in the next year. I don't know how many short sale uh, advertisements I've seen here in the past week about next year. The, the wave is coming, right? We all believe every smart guy I know believes a, a, ch a change is coming. They all think it's going to be maybe uh, not good for the economy change, but we're all trying to get prepared for what's going to happen next. And so back in 08, I was looking at REO properties, but I realized very quickly that wasn't the answer. And so I started uh, exploring all types of marketing. Some worked, some didn't. I've done it all, Jack. I've spent, you know, I've sent a million pieces of direct mail in my time. I've done 
weird advertising, normal advertising. I've done it all. And then I, I, we started talking about the stereotypes of our best sellers. What was, what was going on in that seller's life? And I started to tell this story that I, I tell almost every day still that normally the story goes like this. Dad passed away eight years ago. Mom's been doing the best she can, right? She's on a fixed income. She's piddling around the house doing great until one day she fell down again. And now she had to have surgery and it was a hip surgery. And the doctor comes out and says, hey, when mom gets out of rehab in three weeks, she cannot move home. Now, if Jack and Philip, her brothers, we look at each other, we're like, uh, what? And it's, hey, Jack, it's literally called crisis management. That's what we're going to go through, right? Mm -hmm. And so we look at each other and the number one thing we're going to try to figure out is where is mom going to get the best care? And you and I most likely aren't prepared for that. On average, we live 400 miles away from mom. That's the average. It's hard to rehab a house when you live in town, let alone 400 miles away. Mm -hmm. And so we go out and we try to get advice from people in the senior living world to give us some direction on where mom is going to get the best care. And in that moment, we realize that we're going to need to sell the house uh, to pay for this care. Cause you and I won't pick the cheapest place for mom's care. That's hardly ever how it goes. I always say, we're going to pick the one with the shiniest chandelier. Mm -hmm. And it's just because that's human nature of, we want to take care of our mother, the woman that did everything for us. Right. And so we, if we have the money, we go ahead and put mom in there and just hope that the house sells. We go out and we meet with a realtor because my sister knows a realtor, right? And she said, this is the guy you got to, or the lady you got to call. And the realtor comes in and says, clean this place out and then do this list of demands before I'll list it for you. If you want to try to get that number that Zillow said, and we're looking at each other going, we're, we're still dealing with mom needing to move into senior living. I don't even live here. I'm just in town for the weekend. Cause I, you know, mom's in, getting out of rehab, you know, we're trying to take care of her and the realtor saying we have to clean the place out. And you realize in the basement is mom's taxes from 1978, the workout equipment that's in pristine condition, the VHS tapes, life, you know, life is down there. I mean, you know, there's mm -hmm. a million things in that house. And sometimes even with a family that gets along, it can take two to three months to clean the house out because they all want to do right by the kids and the grandkids so they can come in and grab some pieces. Cause remember mom's moving from a, 1700 square foot house to a 12 by 14 room you know she's going from a 1700 square feet to 160 square feet so most of the belongings she has in that moment need to be divided and everyone has treasures and everyone has trash and everything in between uh, i heard a stat the other day that i thought was pretty hilarious not hilarious just kind of sad really 99 percent of the estates in st louis have five thousand dollars worth of stuff that's what the sales bring with a cost of five thousand dollars to put that sale on so that house full of stuff, 99% of the time in St. Louis, Missouri has zero value. We all think wow. our stuff is worth a, a, a ton, but to get it to where it's going to go, whether it's the trash can or the, or the Smithsonian, right? Everywhere in between mm -hmm. to get it there. Uh, it, the logistics of it is so painful. And so with mom's house, what we do is we try to specialize in that exact moment to help that family with all of those uh, things besides mom's care, right? There's plenty of, we work with people in the care side that refer to us and we try to help with all those other moving parts to give that adult child that's going through that with their mom or dad some good news for a change, right? The, the, the doctor said mom can't move back home. The, the, the finance director said this place is $8,800 a month and we're just like, where the heck is that money gonna come from? And so those kids, those adult children, if, if you go with a system like mom's house or that as it is home buyer that still treats you right, it's for, it's, you know, you just got that news from the realtor that she wants me to clean it out. And with, with the mom's house buyer, they're saying, Hey, take your heirlooms and leave everything else. We'll take care of it. That rings really well in people's ears. Like they, if you treat people right, they really like this option. Mm -hmm. They just want to be treated fairly like anyone does. And so the families, if you give them that option of the retail sale with those pain points or an as is cash buyer, uh, doing it the right way, I've had a lot of success in that. Yeah, you know, I, I, one of the things that I've learned doing this show, um, you mentioned that you were listening or taking a look at, at your previous deals and kind of uh, helping you decide what niche to focus on. But typically there's a bigger reason or there's some other driving purpose that I get the impression that you previously found helping these type of people and talking to the, to the older people. Um, or in these situations, you probably, frankly, enjoy solving these type of problems. 
Yes, sir. And, and, and I want to take it a, a different step too. If I look at my second favorite lead source, which is probate, Mm-hmm. That means we just suffered a loss, right? I love probate leads, but if me and you were brothers again and it's a probate, that means mom's passed away. We're probably in a sad state and, and we're going to look for every dollar we can because it's our inheritance. When mom moves into senior living, nobody gets mad at Nana because she had to move into senior living. And now we just want somebody that's going to take care of that problem and make it go away. It's the only time I've ever seen where it, the price is not nearly as valuable as the trust in that person that's going to buy it because they just want that issue to go away. And then let's talk about like uh, tax sales or like the, or, or uh, bankruptcies or, um, or like a foreclosure or a divorce. The, the human you're dealing with on the other end is kind of got some crap going on, right? They're not, you know what I'm saying? They're not, they're, they're not the happy, I'm a happy guy, right, Jack? So I want to, I, I get my, I, I get, I'm fulfilled with helping the seniors, right? It's fulfilling to help that family. I don't know how many times I've heard, I wish there would have been a book I could have read about what I need to do with mom when the situation happens. Cause it's called crisis management because no one's really prepared for it. Mm-hmm. And so I get to be, I always say I get to wear a Cape. I get to come in and you know, this, all these, it's like problem, problem, problem. Oh, we thought there's a problem. Now this guy's saying that this is over. I sometimes see the weight of their sh- come off their shoulders. Like, Oh, they can take a deep breath and be like, good. I don't, I didn't want to clean out that basement anyway. You know, um, I always say, Jack, I, I, I don't see the treasures. The treasures leave mom's house the first day, you know, but by that second or third weekend when the brother came in town and he's pulling the boxes out of the basement and putting them in the dumpster, his back's hurting. And, you know, there, there's a lot of emotions in what I do in helping these families. And even families that get along are having a tough time in this situation. It's that first mm-hmm. time that your mom that took care of you your whole life can't take care of herself. And so, um, I, I, it's a very fulfilling work, but it, it takes the right person, like you said, that gets a kick out of hearing those stories about mom or dad or, you know, the life that happened there. You know, the, these people have been, I, I buy people's forever homes, Jack, right? The house they never, you know, every Christmas was there, every memory was there. And I, and I take it as an honor to get to buy that and hear their stories. Right. So one of the things that's standing out here is that when you're talking about hearing their stories, you know, we've, as real estate investors, we're all we're always told to make sure we build that rapport. Um, but uh, it seems like you're trying to establish a, a deeper connection than that, what I would say, surface de- re- rapport. I, I agree. And I, I think it starts with building rapport, me building rapport with the people that they are putting trust in. I, I use this analogy of like uh, the mailman. If the mailman came to your house today and said, don't call these other 19 postcards, call this one guy. He's the most trusted buyer in Albuquerque. You'd be like, okay. Like if you needed to sell your house, right? We all, we're all mm-hmm. looking for advice. Well, if me and you are looking to help mom get moved into a senior living place and we're trusting someone to get advice from them and that person says, call Philip, he's the most trusted buyer in town. It's, that's the, re- the rapport is over. Like we've already trusted this person with something way more important than the house and they have a solution for a problem that we've been sitting here thinking, how the world, how in the world is that going to work? Right. And now this person has that solution. I like to build rapport uh, with people that are already the, the senior living world is a trust business. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it, when I get a referral from them, I go out of my way, Jack, to kick some butt, give that family. All, even if I, even if I'll tell them I'm not the right buyer for you, I'm going to leave them with like my credibility packet. I, I go through this so much. I've got a guy that buys old LP records, buys cars, buy gold. I have different people on this list that I give to them and say, Hey, even if you don't, sell me your house. I want to give this to you because I know families that I've helped in the past are going through some of these same questions and here's the vendors that I trust. Mm-hmm. No. So that way, when they go back to that person that I have a rapport with, they, uh, they say, boy, Philip, you know, he, that's his business. They know I'm in the transition business when they meet with me. Not, uh, I feel like my competition sometimes, and for anybody new out there that's listening, buy a good card stock on your cards and always have your cards with you. I feel like sometimes my competition doesn't even have their cards with them. It's like, what? And, and, and sometimes they'll put their hoodie up and they'll walk through the house. They won't even talk to the person. Jack, when I'm in the house, I hardly ever talk about the house. I'm talking about what dad did for a living. I'm talking about what they're going through right now. We're having a conversation and every once in a while I'll sprinkle in, do, do we know the roof age? Mm-hmm. You know, it's not where some people are so clinical. They're trying to be, this is a house transaction. And that, I'm, The house is way secondary for me because I've been doing this 22 years, right? Like the Mm -hmm. house is the easy part. I walk through and do my rehab number in my head and then I get to the end and I, I actually talk about the numbers. I I feel like some people shy away 
from, oh, what's the offer going to be? And they, they're like, I'll get back with you. I'll send you an offer in the mail. I, that's not my personality. I came there to buy their house and I'm going to put my best foot forward to make that happen. And sometimes I buy them on the spot. A lot of times I buy them on the spot. And I'm sure in my career, Jack, somebody's come in and beat me by $1,000 because I did it that way. But I'll, I'm okay with that because I feel like if I show up at their house, build rapport with them and don't make them an offer on the house that I intended to buy that I didn't do my job that day. So my mm -hmm. personality is to actually leave them with, here's my rehab numbers. Because a lot of these, you remember how I said I'm, I'm dealing with the most responsible child? That, per, that person might be 60 years old themselves, that daughter, dealing mm -hmm. with their 80 year old mother. They're gonna have to go convince their brother in North Carolina that some dude named Philip is, is the right guy to sell it to. Well, I'm gonna give her all the ammo she needs to have an intelligent conversation with her brother. And, and us experts, you know, we're experts in this real estate business. Um, we make our money the day we buy it because we can rehab at scale where that layperson, if they just walk into Lowe's or Home Depot and try to hire every retail person, they're going to get killed on what they pay for things, right? So my $40,000 rehab might cost them 65 grand, right? And there's our 25 grand profit in our deal. We earn our money that we make because we do this for a living. Right. So if you like what Philip is talking about here and you want more information, make sure you head over to momshouse.com. I mean, I, I can't believe you got that domain name. I mean, that's, I like good domain names. It's one of my favorite subjects. I, if my eight year old can't spell it, I don't like it. And, and uh, I think there's an online form to see if this would be a good fit, but yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. So you mentioned, you know, you're building that rapport with some of those healthcare providers and stuff. Like, where did you start on that? Like, when you were, do, when you were getting into this, and what you know now, if you knew then, like, where would you Ooh, have started? Great question. I, think, I feel like people hearing us today are, uh, are, are hearing me uh, talk about this, and they're going to do what I did back in 2011. They're going to walk in to a senior living community, put their hand out and say, hey, I'm a house buyer and I'm a realtor. Can I make a relationship with you? It's not the right way to do it. In fact, it's kind of like walking into a uh, surgeon's office while he's in surgery and saying, hey, can I, do re can I build rapport with you? It's like not the right place. And so in my training, I'm going to teach you how to find them in the wild, I like to call it, where they're not at their day job. Um, these people are running around like a school principal. You know, they've got, they've got 140 families they're trying to take care of and they're being torn. I've got 100 stories of their job is way harder than we, we think it is. And it, going into the community, you're going to do more harm than good. And so I teach people how to do it the right way. So they don't have the bumps and bruises that I did. I was just too dumb to stop, Jack. I just kept going because I knew, I knew the time. I always look at sales as a timing, like a conversation. And I knew the conversation was perfect. And it turned out to be the right way. I just had to uh, become the solution for the person that I was helping. And so there's about four people that are in the communities that I help. And there's about another five stakeholders that are outside of the communities that are having that hard conversation with the families at the exact right time. And so I've got about nine stakeholders that uh, are my bread and butter. Sure. So do you do any kind of marketing to these at all? Or do you rely pretty much all on uh, that, that micro network or that niche network that you're building and the relationships you're making there? I, call, I have a product called 20 is Plenty. And the reason why it's named that is if you just have 20 people in your market that know Jack Haas's name, if they think of you when they have this, you could do 20 to 50 deals a year from those relationships and the marketing cost is zero. I mean, if it's something, yeah. No, I think I, I you're frozen. I mean, a lot of people listen to that, you, you know? Yeah, I mean, if you did 20 deals a year at 15,000 a piece, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's very valuable. That, that's, that's very attractive because there's a lot of people spending a lot of money and a lot of time on marketing that uh, is getting a fraction of those returns. Agreed. Agreed completely. And it's, I feel like it's getting worse because the market's so strong. And there's so many investors out there right now. Our dollars are getting stretched further and further. And so I'm building something that's not reliant on that. Right. So can you talk a little bit about like uh, how some of these conversations go? Like with when you're, when you're approaching somebody within this, in this power 20 or <laughs> that you, yeah. that you, 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 you created, like uh, how do you, how have you uh, approached them or how do you, how do you market to them? Sure. I'll give you the sentence. 
this sentence has made me a million dollars. So your listeners should write this down. I'll give you two sentences. And I want you to listen in the sentence and find out if I said the word investor or realtor anywhere in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll say it right now. I'll say, hey, hey, Jack, um, do you ever have a situation where they want to move mom in, but they can't until they sell mom's house? And they'll get a giggle and they'll be like, Phil, every day, that's my job. That's, what I, that's one of my biggest problems. And I'll say, are you working with anyone that's going through that problem or that situation right now? And what's going to happen next, Jack? They're going to say one of two things. They're going to say, yes, I am working with Julie and her mom's going through that right this second. And then I'll say, can I get Julie's number? <laughs> Look at that. I just asked for the sale and I'm on my third sentence, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or they'll say, oh man, I wish you would have met Ed last week. He had a heck of a time getting his house on the market. The deal fell through twice, blah, you know, every, every real estate story you've ever heard. Right. And what I did is I just unlocked their brain as I'm a guy that fixes a problem that that person, that person sitting across from me has every single day in their business. And I didn't say I'm an investor because that can be misconstrued as a, a shark investor or somebody negative. And I didn't say I'm a realtor, even though I have a license, I don't start with that. Um, that's not my goal to be like, try to get a listing. You know, I'm trying, I'm a in home investor. I'm a house buyer. And so I want to teach people how to do it the right way. Sure. Do you have anybody that comes and do you market at all to, to the p- potential sellers? Like, uh, or is it just mostly relying on that, on that group? If you think about it, I, I like to work smarter, not harder. So with the average child living 400 miles away, if, if um, mom is in St. Louis and the brother lives in Chicago, it's really hard for me to do enough, I, I'm not to the point where I have the millions of dollars a month of marketing budget to hit the guy in Chicago to try to find his mom in Chicago, right? So mm-hmm. I wait. Let's talk about it this way. You know, in direct mail, think about what a direct mail list usually looks like. It's over the age of 65, has equity, and has lived there 20 years, right? Mm-hmm. Why would somebody mail to that list? Obviously, it's because there's a chance that they might be going through what I'm actually talking about. I've mm-hmm. flipped the business around. Instead of spray and pray, my clients are saying, I need to sell right now, right? I've taken away right. the whole if and when and hope and all that junk. And it's re- literally to the moment they just found out, they just realized, they've just been told, we need to sell. The timing, there is no better lead I've found in my 22 years. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things too that people need to be aware of, you know, you early on in our conversation, we talked about people using stealth voicemails and automatic tests. It's all this automation. And, and uh, frankly, the people that you're talking about more times than not don't have that technology to receive that type of messaging. Not at all. Do you know how many times I've had to drive across town to hand deliver a contract because there's no email? Right. Uh, you better believe I'll drive across town for that contract, you know? You're right. No, I, no I, you're, I you're very right. And maybe the adult children are a little better with technology, but they're so fragmented that it's, I'm, t- I'm telling you where the, where the people who has their attention, right? It's like that mailman analogy. If you, if you had a whole group of mailmen all singing your praises, well, even better is the people that are helping you with your mom in that time of need. That person's very trusted. And when that person said, Philip is the best guy to go to game over. Mm-hmm. You know, just be, com- be competent, do what you say. I hate that. I have to say that out loud, but in our investor world, like I like the act of wholesaling Jack, but what scares me to death, what keeps me up at night is if your only exit strategy is to wholesale only, and you have no way to close any other way, that's not good for what I do because I've done this enough, bought thousands of houses, right? We can't always wholesale them. We have to close on them like our contract says, right? And so mm-hmm if you stand up grandma with her bags packed and you call her on the 30th day, even though that might be in your contract that you can do that and say, Hey, sorry, I'm not buying your house. That reverberates throughout the whole channel. And that's just, that's not what I'm looking for. Right. Yeah. And um, let's just be blunt here. Not everybody has their bank situation set up. So I even help my students that I teach on how to find ways to fund these deals. Right. I want you to be able to do what you say. I'm going to help those people to set that up. Cause I know, People starting off, that's always like, well, where am I going to get the money from? And I want everyone to know, finding the good deal is the hard part. It's not funding the good deal. Funding is easy if it's actually a deal. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting in, in the fact that you've really found a way or a niche here that uh, everybody has, and you've convinced me that we, you can, we kind of come about this the wrong way, especially when it comes to marketing. Um, 
So uh, you. yeah, you got you got my head spinning. You just you just said you're gonna make my head explode here today, and I, I think you're pulling it off. <laughs> well, good, good. So and I wish my we had I wish we had four, bit. four more days to talk about it. Like I I feel like I'm. To, to do a deep dive into the senior living world, there's a lot of stuff you just need to know, right? It's, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people say, well, I think I've helped people like that before. You probably have. But if you don't indoctrinate yourself into the senior living world the right way, uh, they're going to see through it. Um, a lot of investors, he, there's a lot of investors might start, but then they don't take the time to actually build the relationships. But I'm here to say, if you build them right, you can build a business that comes to you and even in the future, no matter who uh, the president is or, or what the economy is like, what I do is going to be relevant because people will continue to get older. Mm -hmm. That's not going away. And if you look at the stats, I love this stat, Jack, 70% uh, of Americans, 70% of Americans over the age of 65 will live in some sort of assisted care before they pass away. So, you know, as much as we like probate leads and other types of leads, the vast majority are going to need to sell that forever home well before uh, probate ever happens. Right. That's where the market actually is. No, I, I get it. So when, you're, when your uh, students get one of these houses, it's easy to see that reputation is a big part of this. I mean, you have to do what you say. But what do, what do they do with the houses once they get them? Do they well, I hope that I hope they keep them as rentals or they'll rehab them or wholesale them. You know how they dispose of it. I don't I don't care how they dispose of the houses. I hope they build a rental portfolio or whatever they want to do with them. You know, when you get to a, a certain volume, you can't rehab them all. You can't hotel them all. You can't wholesale them all. You know, you, you have to have different tools in your belt. And so what I hope is if I mean, you said you I said we're in the marketing business. Uh, having too many leads is never going to be a problem. Right. That's a good mm -hmm. issue. Uh, we'll figure out a way to, I mean, finding the deals is the hard part in our business. It's not the knowing what to do with them on the back end. I, I love the fact that if you had that problem, that you get to pick and choose, cherry pick the rehabs you want to do, cherry pick the wholesales you want to do, the, the rentals you want to do, and then the market will absorb the rest. And like I said, I have nationwide buying networks, right? I want to buy houses nationwide too. So I help my students by actually giving them an outlet to sell them to me in my group. So. Sure. No, I, it's the procuring that. of it, right? It's, the, it's that boot on the ground, Jack. You know, if I was a younger, I'm 42, I'm not that old, but if I was a younger man, I might have tried to get employees in every city for this, you know, but I don't want to chase around 500 people nationwide. I want somebody that knows the streets of Baltimore, <laughs> that knows the streets of Chicago. Like I, I know my streets of St. Louis, right? I, I lived there for 40 years. I know my St. Louis streets, but I'm never going to be an expert in every city. And so, if, if you know your city, the nuances, and, and want to help people, it's a really good business for people that uh, want to help others. And the real estate side is almost like the easy part of it. You know, there's three people I help, um, the real estate, or I'm sorry, the senior living industry, the families that are moving into senior living, and then the investor. That, that's mm -hmm. the three different distinct channels that I'm, that I'm working with every day. Sure. So, um, well, we're, we've quickly chewed up half, over half an hour here. So I, I did want to uh, ask one last question. And is, sure. that is, uh, is there a question you wished I would have asked? Ooh. Hmm. I, I, I try to think about if I was starting a business today, where I would go. And mm -hmm. everybody, you know how you talked about automation earlier and how everybody... We, there's so much technology that nobody wants to work, right? We think if I get this, then I won't have to do this. If I get this, then I won't have to do that. But to get all those things to work, it's still a job, right? We're all working. We're all networking. I'm just telling you right now, you're not networking with the right people yet. And when you use my system, as long as you have a cell phone, the technology is meaningless. So I wish you, you know what I mean? That's, that's maybe a stat mm -hmm. or a fact I'd like people to know that right. I feel like we make this business so damn hard sometimes by thinking there's a magic bullet out there that replaces work and there's not, but I can teach you how to build a rolling harvest and, a, and an ongoing relationship that'll pay dividends for years versus the one and done marketing that we're so used to that most people preach. Sure. Uh, well, uh, you know, I usually try to end the, end this with a, with a few takeaways. Um, I don't know if I can top what you just said there. Um, well, thank but, you. Uh, I, I uh, did want to call out a couple things. Um, 
I really like the lines and if people uh, regarding like what they've said to build that initial relationship with that, uh, those 20 people. Um, have you ever had a family member that uh, can't move in because they, they still need to sell their house? I know I'm paraphrasing quite a bit there, but that is a powerful line and you can rephrase that in a number of ways to start any conversation with a distressed seller. I mean, that's, that's great. Um, yes. What you're dealing with here is a very, I want to say is a niche thing, but in the end, I, this is a, this is, if everybody uh, that's listening to the show is honest with themselves, a majority of the houses that we bought, we've bought, purchased are probably in this situation. And I've just, hammered people with marketing versus establishing a network in this way. Um, so uh, we all have Jack, you're not, you're not exclusive in that, buddy. we all have done that. That's why we mailed to those, those lists. Right. Right. Uh, some of those stats that you threw out were pretty shocking. What was you said in, in St. Louis, in your neighborhood, 90% of the estate sales basically pay for the estate sale itself. I mean, there's, uh, that's, that's really a telling thing. It's worse than zero, right? Cause it took your time. It took your time. Exactly. And people don't put a lot of value on their own time. That's, uh, that's another thing. They'd rather argue over what the cost of the salt shakers did sell for at the sale. 70% so, <laughs> of Americans live in, in assisted care. I mean, or will before eventually they get there. Yeah. Yeah. Before they pass. Yeah. So it's, it's almost an inevitability. Um, yeah, some, this, this has been a really eye-opening conversation. Um, I appreciate your time today. And if, if people want more advice or uh, consider some of your coaching, uh, make sure you head over to momshouse.com for more information. Uh, was there any other way that they could reach out to you, Philip? Uh, momshouse.com. Um, I'm on uh, face, Facebook as well, Philip Vincent. You can find me there. I, uh, I'm very active on there. And so um, momshouse.com or, or Facebook would be great. Okay. Well, I appreciate it again. And uh, let's uh, do this again sometime soon. Uh, like you said, I think you and I had, would have a lot to talk about. Thank you, Jack. I, I can go. I've got days worth of content we could talk about. So I would love that. <laughs> I'm sure. So, well, thank you, sir. Have a good day. Thanks, Jack.